Welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist on a mission to discover how to age well, look and feel good for longer and share what I find with you. And regular viewers will be aware that I've become a big fan of red light in recent years, incorporating both red and near infrared light at home to help support the appearance of my skin and its health because red light is thought to stimulate increased energy production in our cells. And I've spoken to several contributors on the channel about red light in the last couple of years, including skincare founder and science graduate Bev May Sanderson. She spent considerable time poring over the research around red light to find the right approach to treat rosacea, which she struggled with on her own skin. And she's been able to share some great advice with us in the past around how to use red light safely and effectively without overdoing it. So I'll link to that interview below. But with some of my more recent conversations on the channel focusing on the skin microbiome, I wanted to find out what impact, if any, red light could have on the microbes that live on our skin, which are thought to play a role in our immune system and also in keeping our skin healthy. And considering Bev has a degree in microbiology, and virology, she's been able to look into this for us. And you'll hear now from her about the impact red light could have on the microbiome based on some fascinating gut health studies, and also why she's particularly enthusiastic about the potential of pulsed light. Bev, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for having me back, Claire. It's lovely to be here. And I've been exploring on the channel recently the skin microbiome what it's comprised of, and the notion that we should be highly mindful of it when deciding on our skincare routines. And one thing that crossed my mind, and which is why I wanted to talk to you again, is whether we have any research into how red light may or may not affect our skin's microbiome. And I know you've been taking a little look at that for us. What insight can you offer? As you'll recall, Claire, my background is microbiology. I started as a microbiologist. So the skin microbiome is definitely a subject that's that's really close to my heart. And as somebody with rosacea, I'm aware that the microbiome isn't just the skin, it's also the gut. And a lot of these skin conditions start in the gut. Mm. And that's certainly been said about rosacea. So I think that's a really good place to start. You know, let's let's look at some of the studies that relate to the, the gut microbiome. There are certain bacteria um, within the gut which are associated with a healthy gut and protection against diseases like IBS and, and diabetes. So scientists in, in general are very interested in exploring ways that they can change the gut environment and, and photobiomodulation has been looked at as one of those modalities to change the gut environment because what they're looking to do is to increase the abundance of those healthy bacteria. So there's there's a scientist in Australia called Bicknell who's done a lot of studies and his initial study was setting up an animal model. Mm -hmm. So this is using mice and uh, his team separated the mice into four different groups. Two of the groups were treated with near-infrared radiation Radiation always sounds like a negative word, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's one of those scary words. Uh, it's red light therapy, but near infrared. Um, and then the third group was treated with red light. And then the fourth group is a control. Mm -hmm. um, and then after 14 weeks of treatment, they analysed the, the faeces of, of these mice to see whether there was any change in the, the gut bacteria. So I will say that, the, that no mice were, were harmed in the making of this experiment. What they saw after this 14 week period was that there was a huge increase in the diversity of the microbiota, the microorganisms in the gut, particularly, so in all the treated groups, not in the control group, but particularly in the group that had these repeated sessions of near infrared. So one group was treated with a single session of near infrared and the other with repeated treatments. And it was within that group that they identified this particular bacterium called allobaculum right. which is is known to be it's known to protect the gut um, by it produces uh, certain short chain fatty acids that help to protect the gut and reduce inflammation and in the group that was treated with repeated near infrared the allobaculum increased 400 fold in its density gosh 
It's just extraordinary when you think that that has happened through light because, you know, you often think of the of the gut, you just relate it with diet, basically. And that's the thing that has the impact on our bacteria. I know there must be other factors, but light is not one that you consider as extraordinary. Photobiomodulation is the modality that keeps on giving, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> anyway, he went on to do some case studies with uh, with humans. One was a, a breast cancer patient and the other was a, a Parkinson's uh, patient. Um, again, because those conditions are associated with gut dysbiosis, so an imbalance in the gut. And um, photobiomodulation was understood to... To, to be a therapeutic uh, modality for, for treating these conditions, but nobody had really looked at the change in the gut microbiota. So he looked, he tested samples um, with the cancer patient. Um, for example, they took samples before treatment, after radiotherapy, and then after 12 weeks of red light therapy. And there was no change, interestingly, after the radiotherapy to the gut microbiome, no change whatsoever. Mm. But after the photobiomodulation, they saw, again, greater diversity of bacteria and more of the good bacteria and less of the bad. Wow. Interesting. And exactly really, exactly the same in the, the Parkinson's patient. Again, it was an uplift in those commensal bacteria and less pathogenic bacteria. So it really does support that red light therapy can have a huge impact on, on the microbiome. I was just going to ask um, if they shared any suggestion as to why, what, what they thought was happening there within the cells. Yeah, um, well, they said that it's not a direct effect on the bacteria, but that it's an effect on the cells themselves, helping the cells to secrete molecules that the bacteria need. So kind of going back to what we've talked about before, you know, with, when we've talked about the benefits for the skin, that it's putting energy into the cell and helping them do what they do best, basically. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Just creating a healthy environment. Um, I mean, you mentioned at the start that link between gut and skin and, and yes. something you've been considering um, when you've been looking at rosacea treatments. And, you know, we know there is a connection there, don't we, through the sort of gut. We Absolutely. talk about the gut brain um, skin access, something that needs to be explored and will be. Um, but yeah, I mean, what are your own thoughts when when that comes to, you know, rosacea and conditions like that and how they might be linked? Well, for me, it's been a bit of a light bulb moment because, um, you know, I do my anti-aging treatments with red light, but I think now I'm going to pay far more attention to maybe treating my abdomen area as well. Because one of the things we do know about rosacea is that Sometimes it's connected to SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So if I treat my abdomen as well, you've kind of got this double prong attack to reduce your rosacea. Because the other element is that they talk about um, you have an overabundance of microbial peptides on the skin as well. So I can treat my face and I can treat my abdomen to help reduce my rosacea. And there are published, there is published data around this. So I'll link some of the papers below that talk about yeah. treating skin for rosacea with with red red and blue light which we'll come on to and everything all the research we've discussed it would be great actually to include links for the audience so they can have a look at that when you are uh, looking at treating your abdomen and in some of the research that, that's that's happened before i mean is that the mix of red light and infrared that you'd be looking to use through a panel for the abdomen what we're yeah. interested in is near infrared because it's near yeah. infrared that penetrates deeply into the skin. The red light would not reach the abdomen. Okay. It's the shorter wavelengths, the red and the blue, which are great for superficial tissue, so for treating the skin effectively. So it's the blue light that is a short wavelength. It's 400 to 470 nanometers, and red light is 600 to 700 nanometers. So that's great for treating superficial yeah. tissue. And they have, again, there's, there's more published data around using red and blue light together to treat not just rosacea, but acne, and you'll be familiar with uh, masks out there, LED masks that treat acne with red and blue light combined because that's yeah. better than blue light alone. There's a fantastic clinical study that's been done in Korea with 35 um, participants that uses red and blue light, and there was a great reduction in lesions for acne and and uh, inflammation was greatly reduced as well. So that's a fantastic study we can link below. 
with red light devices, I mean, you now sell some devices through Maysama and I see that you, you promote pulsed light over constant. Um, we've spoken about this briefly before, but what do you think the biggest advantages are with pulsed over continual red light? I mean, for me, I'm completely on this pulsed light journey now. And this really came from an early discussion that we had with Professor Andre Summer. He's one of the leading photobiomodulation scientists. He's actually the guy that wrote the original paper around green tea and red light therapy, a dynamic duo in, in skin rejuvenation. And um, I had a, a conversation with, with Andre Summer discussing the Roybal theorem and the better results that we were getting from combining that with red light therapy. And he said to me, you should be using pulse light. And I said, but, but why? And and the reasons that he gave me were, were so compelling that I felt that it was something that we had to, to bring to market really within our offering. The first reason being that when you look at the mechanism of red light, it uh, you shine the red light on the cell and it makes the cytosol, um, which is the fluid inside the cell, expand. So your cell will expand when you shine red light on it because it increases the volume of the cell. Then when you turn the light off, the cell contracts. So if you have pulse light, you get this breathing effect where the cell expands and contracts, expands and contracts. And what happens, you'll have micronutrients that surround the cell and then those are sucked into the cell when the cell contracts. And the reason that Andre Sommer explained this to me is because their team are doing lots of research around anti-cancer drugs. Mm -hmm. And one of those drugs is green tea or EGCG from green tea, effectively. And so it's, it's a phenomenon they call transmembrane convection anyway, where it's a better drug delivery system if they use pulse light because it helps to uptake these micronutrients more effectively he said if you use that for skin care then it will increase the bioavailability of your skin care and then increase the efficacy of your skin care so that made perfect sense to me yeah the other reason is is a little more complex but i i think that your educated uh, subscribers will will relate to it we'll try and keep up <laughs> yes <laughs> but i think they'll be familiar generally with the term of free radicals that we, yes. we generally understand that free radicals are these very excited molecules that go in search of a, they have an unpaired electron and so they scavenge to try and find this other electron um, and then they're happy bunnies. But in the meantime, they can do a lot of damage to, to cell components, to lipids, to proteins. Um, so free radicals in excess yeah. are not great. That's it. We, we talk about wanting to um, avoid creating a buildup of free radicals. That's it. We don't want an overabundance of free radicals, but they're not all bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important to understand also that they are signaling molecules. So a low amount of free radicals is beneficial. And it's actually those that kickstart the whole process with photobiomodulation. It's the free radicals that signal to the cell to produce DNA. Um, all the things that happen are triggered by this initial burst of free radicals. What we don't want, though, is this buildup of free radicals. So if we have a prolonged session of red light. And I say session because when I say treatment, I think people think that they can't use red light day after day, Yeah, but you can, you know, we're talking about a single treatment. And during that single treatment, the red light produces free radicals as a byproduct, and that continues over that session. And then what happens is when you get this abundance of free radicals, it can lead to oxidative stress, uh, but it also reduces the efficacy of your red light device because you want the red light device to produce more ATP, more cellular energy, mm -hmm. and you want it to drive cell proliferation, you know, regeneration of cells. When you get an excess of free radicals, it actually starts to inhibit those very two processes that you're using your red light for to start with. Mm -hmm. So you get this curve and you get inhibition if you go too far, which is why we always have a treatment time that you should adhere to. Yeah. Where pulse light gives you a benefit over static red light is that you don't get the buildup of free radicals. The reason being that when the light is on, you get a burst of free radicals. Then when the light is off, you get 
well, the cell will then use up its reserves of ATP that have been produced. And the free radicals that were produced have a very, very short lifespan. So they just dissipate. You talked about nanoseconds. I remember that sticking yeah. in my mind before, yeah. which was really yeah. interesting. Yeah. So they just yeah. they could they come and go in nanoseconds, basically. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you only get a build up if it's on continuously. But if the light is on off, on off, you get this wave and you don't get the build up. Mm -hmm. So what we've seen, and this is supported by lots of clinical studies out there, that you get accelerated cell proliferation and you get upregulation of ATP. So you get more cellular energy and you get more of the cells produced that produce collagen, which is why we see more collagen produced with pulse light. So it's complicated, but it's good to know. <laughs> It does make sense. I always feel yeah. bad in these scenarios um, when people have, you know, they've just gone out and they've bought a red light mask and it's a constant mask. And now it's like, oh, great. I should have got a pulsed one. But I mean, for somebody who's we, there are still lots of benefits to be had from continual red light. And it comes back to, you know, if you've got the mask, just not sitting with it on for over 10 minutes or something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. You can still get yeah. those benefits. Um, for me, uh, when I use the panel now, I do have it on constant uh, for a period of time. But what I do, I mean, I look ridiculous, but I'm moving my head and doing my exercises when I've got the constant on, including, including kind of kissing the ceiling like this. I mean, my husbands and sons walk in and they just go, what now? You know, <laughs> what insanity is she bringing now? Um, and then I'll put it on on pulse mode um, and I wear the goggles, but I find on, on pulse mode, there is still quite a strobing effect. So sometimes I cover my goggles with my fingers. I mean, what do you advise for that, for people who find that, that there's that kind of strobing effect? Yeah, I mean, strobing or pulsing is is definitely a, a different experience. And, yeah. um, and it, it is an adjustment in all fairness, but mm. you know, if you go sailing for the first time, you haven't found your sea legs, have you, on day one? You know, yeah. it's, it takes it takes time. And what we recommend is that you start slow. So start by just adding one minute of pulse light onto your regular red light treatment. Okay. And that would be enough to get the benefit of improved skincare absorption. So you've already got that benefit if you just do one minute on the end of your pulse light session. In an ideal world, you know, to get the benefits of more collagen and, you know, increased um, cell proliferation and upregulated ATP, all those wonderful things, then ideally you want to kind of switch to pulse light for your entire treatment. So we would say that just drop a little bit each time of your static red light and add on a little bit more pulse light, which is why that we've got the timer for one minute, three minutes, six minutes and nine minutes, but nine minutes is only if you don't bother with pulse light at all, you would just do nine minutes of the continuous mm -hmm. red light session. So you'd start with one minute on the end of six minutes of continuous light, and then you would switch and probably do three minutes and three minutes, and then eventually you would do six minutes of pulse light. Okay. So start slow and steady. For some people, they can do that within a week. Um, some people tell me they actually prefer pulse light. They actually find it more relaxing than continuous light. Um, for others, you know, it is distracting. So it is normal to mm -hmm. feel jumpy when you first do it. That is a normal reaction. And, um, you know, just take your time. There's lots of things that you can do to adjust to it. One of the things would be to make sure that you are in a well-lit room. You know, I think I made the mistakes sort of early on of doing an evening session and it's dark around me and then you put the light on you've got the brightness of the light yeah and the pulse thing and it's you know it's a lot for your brain to adjust to even with your goggles on so start in a well-lit room because you've got less differential then between the brightness okay turn turn your head slightly to the right for half your session and slightly to the right uh, left and right yeah <laughs> So that way, then you're you're not directing the light again into the retina. Even though you've got your goggles on, you will see a reduction in the kind of kaleidoscope patterns that you see in front of your your face. And if you still find it too much, do you know what? You could still reduce the intensity of your light to fifty percent, which our panel allows you to do to reduce that intensity to fifty percent or even twenty five percent. But even at fifty percent, 
you would still have a higher dosing than you would have with a mask. Right. Interesting. But, okay. but with a panel, you are treating face, neck and deck all in one session. So it gives you that benefit. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I like it, because it allows me to cover my neck and decolletage, as they call it. All, and, I, you know, hands are in there as well. Really, everything I can possibly fit in is squeezed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, people do that with a panel. So with a panel, we use three different pulse light frequencies. We use 10, 20 and 30 hertz. Now, when you look at the studies on pulse light, they are right across the board from one hertz up to 1400 hertz. But generally, there seems to be an well more more success with the lower frequencies to one to a hundred hertz, which is why we picked the lower uh, pulse frequencies with the panel. We also felt it was important for people to see that the panel is pulsing because <laughs> it sounds crazy, but with the mask, it has a different frequency, it's a hundred hertz. And mm -hmm. the number of people that contact us say it's, it's not pulsing, it is pulsing. We've actually, deliberately chosen 100 hertz so it's invisible to the naked eye had we done that with the panel and it was invisible to the naked eye it would be possible that people wouldn't know it was pulsing and they wouldn't wear the eye the protective eyewear okay. now the protective eyewear is necessary with the panel because you are directing light into the retina yeah. with the mask it's not necessary one the light intensity is reduced secondly the pulse light is around the eye yeah. not directly cut out it's perfectly yeah. safe not to wear goggles with your mask. We do provide them for your comfort if you want to wear them, but it's not necessary to wear them. Okay, that's clear. Thank you so much, Bev. I always appreciate um, your, your sharing your insight with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Claire. Thank you. Light therapy could have so many potential applications for health as well as skin aging. Just last week, I read a report which I'll link below about a study in mice that found flashing or pulsed light could help flush out toxic proteins in the brain that may contribute to Alzheimer's. So as a result, this approach is now being trialed on Alzheimer's patients. And it's just an absolutely fascinating time to be following the science behind light therapy in general. And red light really has become one of the biggest interventions I use as I age alongside lifestyle. So let me know if and how you're using red light in the comments or other forms of light therapy. I'll include a link to the details of how I use red light along with my wider skincare routine below for those who are interested. And don't forget that uh, you can follow more advice and information from me around how to age well on my website, honest.scott. One of my main aims is to continue to bring you content free of charge. And if you want to support the channel, you can do that by hitting the like and subscribe buttons if you haven't already done so and sharing my content with others who you think might be interested. As always, thank you for being here today and I hope to see you next time.